children locked away behind high walls a dominant image of the abusive system which irish society used in the past to contain tens of thousands of its children it's not like that anymore or so people would like to think it is true that the walls have been dismantled but what of the secrecy on which the abuse of children has always thrived this program has been able to compile an alarmingly long list of children's homes where abuse has occurred in more recent times. Abuse which has effectively been kept secret with little evidence of any public investigations or inquiries. It seems that walls of silence may well have replaced the familiar walls of stone. There is one history of gross abuse which firmly cements the past to the present in terms of the legacy today of the old industrial school system of childcare in Ireland. It is the extraordinary story of the boys of St. Joseph's Kilkenny. Ed Walsh was just four years old when he entered St. Joseph's. I think every child in that orphanage suffered somehow or other. If they weren't sexually abused, they suffered mentally and physically. Some, maybe one or two, were lucky. I don't know any of them that were lucky, and I've seen a lot of them since over the years, and I don't know any of them that have been lucky. Maybe the lucky ones are the dead ones. They took the easy way out. Maybe that's what we all should have done. What shocks one to the core when you look at St. Joseph's, Kilkenny, and other places, is that so many people, in fact, heard the alarm bells and were told about things but for whatever reason, nothing effective happened. And so cover-up sometimes is an emotive term to use, but I don't think it would be particularly inappropriate in this case. What happened in St. Joseph's Kilkenny was one of the worst examples ever in Ireland of widespread sexual abuse of children. There is every possibility that those involved continued to abuse children right into the 1990s. So far, only a fraction of the potential damage caused to children by these paedophiles is even known about. What has happened in St. Joseph's is we've had a catalogue of the worst form of abuse, with some of the worst abusers convicted in this country, basically running amok and complaints by children and complaints by co-workers were not listened to, or even if they were listened to, no action was taken. And so we wait until the end of the 90s before we see these people brought before courts and convicted. In late 1997, childcare worker David Murray pleaded guilty to gross sexual abuse of young boys at St. Joseph's Kilkenny during the 1970s. He had also abused his two young foster sons. David Murray is now serving a 10-year prison sentence. During the court hearing, a list was read out of all the residential children's homes where he had worked after leaving St. Joseph's. He had had contact with literally hundreds of children during his career, but so far there has been no public investigation into the potentially enormous damage he may have caused to children in these homes. In sharp contrast, barely one month after David Murray's conviction, the swimming abuse public inquiry was established. This was a direct response to the conviction of swimming coach Derry O'Rourke for the sexual abuse of young Irish swimmers. I cannot understand why a similar investigation has not been conducted into St. Joseph's and Kilkenny, and particularly into the career of David Murray. And I think that highlights very clearly this extraordinary reluctance on the part of the state to investigate residential care in any way at all. It is no problem dealing with child abuse generally, and investigating it when it comes to residential childcare, when it comes to dealing with religious congregations, it seems to be extraordinarily reluctant to take any role in investigating what went on there. There's no child safe, not with the likes of them people running around. And it's still going on, I'm sure it's still going on in this country. And until they do inquiries and 
sorting places out. They have them in houses now. They don't call them orphanages anymore. They call them houses, homes, set homes. It's still going on. It. Of course it is. Maybe not as bad as it was in the 60s and then days. It's going on all right. The story of Kilkenny begins in the mid-1960s. At that time, the Irish Sisters of Charity ran two industrial schools in the town, one for boys, the other for girls. In 1966, the nuns closed their institution for boys. The older children were transferred to Artane, Letterfrack and Clonmel. But the little boys, 32 of them under the age of six, were moved up the road to St. Joseph's, the Kilkenny Industrial School for Girls. There, the boys were confined to a small space where they ate, slept, played, and had their lessons. Some of them were soon to experience their first sexual abuse. Teresa Connolly, the young woman who looked after them, was convicted earlier this year for the abuse of four of the boys. This first abuse of the boys happened in the late 1960s, at a time marked by the growing awareness of social problems in Ireland. And as part of this trend, criticism of the industrial school system had become more vocal. In 1970, the dramatic Kennedy report on industrial schools was published. It was savagely critical of the system used to detain children and recommended that it be immediately scrapped. The inquiry committee had been appointed by the government with Justice Eileen Kennedy of the Children's Court in the chair. And the Kennedy report did have an impact its publication resulted in the gradual closure of most, but not all, the industrial schools in Ireland. The Kennedy Report is to hurled a new way of dealing with, with industrial schools and the children in industrial schools. And on, on a superficial level, there were some changes made in St. Joseph's. The boys went out to school. Uh, they went to the, the local national schools. We had in the Kennedy report, the constant exhortation to carefully select people and to have people who were qualified look after children in these settings. In fact, this is the time when the first, I mean, the, the, the man who Judge Matthews in December of 97 referred to as, the, 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 you know, the, the, had the greatest impact uh, on the young lives uh, in the history of childcare was David Murray. Now, he sort of enters Saint, the world of St. Joseph's around the time that Kennedy's report comes out. And he uh, develops a relationship with the, we say, the, the boys between the ages of 9 and 11. The first night David Murray came, it was all sweet, like meeting someone new. But that same night, it was straight into your bedroom, into my bedroom, or into any, you'd hear him in the other kids' bedrooms. And that's, that's when the nightmare did begin. Uh, he'd take you to the cinema. He insisted, when, he, when you were in the cinema, that you didn't wear underpants. And you had short trousers on. And he'd take you to the cinema and he'd have a boy either side of him. And he would play around with, both, with the boys on either side of him. He'd put a coat over over the myself and he would play with you literally while the film was on. Now when you were in the cinema that was bad enough you know to be abused there then he'd take you, you'd, you were taken home like eight o'clock nine o'clock at night and you went to bed in your cubicle there was two to a cubicle and you came in and abused the two in the cubicle you'd be lying in your bed and you'd be shaken now literally you would be shaken and he would rub whatever on your backside and then he would stick his penis in your ass and the pain there was too much pain to describe it you, I can't describe the pain and he but he'd spend 10 minutes in your room and he might visit the boy in the room the other boy in the room beside you if he didn't he went along to another boy's bed but this went on every night of the week if he wasn't in my room five nights of the week he was in another kid's room seven nights of the week it was around this time that the first full-time professional childcare course in Ireland was established. It was located in Kilkenny, in the same grounds as the industrial school. It was, however, under separate management. 
Sister Stanislaus Kennedy had been centrally involved in setting up the course and was its co-director. David Murray was among its first graduates. He came highly recommended from the course and was immediately employed by the Sisters of Charity to look after the boys in St. Joseph's. He pleaded guilty to counts of buggery, indecent assault and gross indecency on ten of these boys. Now this isn't, these weren't isolated incidents. These were continuous assaults on these boys. They were depraved assaults. They were assaults that took place with the knowledge of other boys that these were going on, that this was the instrument by which control was kept. Now, a number of the boys have always contended that at that stage, in around 72, 73, was when they started to make complaints. I remember telling the nuns, the head nun, one morning, and her reaction was, she gave me a clip in the back of the head and sent me on my way and told me not to be lying. And then she told the housemaster who was looking after us that I was telling lies, or that the boys were telling lies and that she didn't want that going on. This programme has discovered evidence that Sister Joseph Conception O'Donoghue, the nun in charge of St. Joseph's, did in fact realise that in her own words, something serious was going on. She was interviewed in 1995 by the Gardaí in the course of their investigations into child sexual abuse at St. Joseph's. Sister Conception stated to the Gardaí that she had reported her concerns at the time to the Department of Education. The Department of Education, for its part, denies that it was ever aware that children in St. Joseph's were being abused during the 1970s. The department stated to this program that it was not informed by Sister Conception or by anyone else of such allegations of abuse. Ultimately, what happens is, is that at least two of the boys continued to make complaints. And we hear in the course of the, of the Murray trial that the manager, the Sister of Charity, uh, brings him in and says, look, we're still hearing these allegations. And Murray resigns. But he's been there from the f roughly the 1st of September of 1971 right through to the end of 1976. So we have effectively five years of horror in, the, in St. Joseph's. Now, what happens next is almost beyond belief, which is that the person they brought in to replace David Murray, Miles Brady, basically takes up from where he left off. He was initially very, very uh, abusive in the physical sense against them. He would, you know, punch them directly to the face. Uh, you know, he, 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 would, he would inflict very drastic physical beatings on them. And then he moved into indecently assaulting uh, a number of them. And again, he pleaded guilty to indecent assaults on a number of the boys. The first day I met Miles Brady, like all I could smell off him was whiskey. Big tall man, grey hair. And the nickname stuck with him for as long as I was there, Whiskey Brett. I'd been in prison, I spent a lot of time in prison. And I'd met the worst men in the world. But there's none of these men would keep up on Miles Brady. He was an animal. The boxes, the beatings, broken legs, twisted arms, the beatings alone for a 13-year-old kid. He would send you into the little room and say, get in there and I'll be in in a minute and I'm going to break your legs. And they were the words, and them words will still haunt me to this day. Literally, he would say, I'll break your legs. And he would go in and he would have no hesitation and he'd come in with a clinched fist and he would box you in the face. I have a mouthful of false teeth because of Miles Brady. We at the Kilkenny Social Service Centre try to understand every problem that comes in. We try to see a solution. One and of the most extraordinary aspects of these events was that they were happening right in the middle of what was socially the most enlightened place in Ireland at the time. Several documentaries were made about Kilkenny and its pioneering social services. There isn't charity 
and social service, but the social service and charity can be the same thing, and it depends on the community in which it works. Caritas Christi Urget Nos, the charity of Christ spurs us on. That's the motto of the Irish Sisters of Charity. It was to these sisters that Dr. Birch, the Bishop of Ossery, turned for help when he first conceived his plan for organizing the social services of his diocese. He knew of the work being done by officials. The town was a hothouse of social awareness. Kilkenny social services were to be a prototype for the entire country. All of this was driven by the Catholic Church, by Bishop Birch and the Sisters of Charity. The headquarters of Kilkenny Social Services were also in the same grounds as the Industrial School, where the same Sisters of Charity had employed paedophiles David Murray and Miles Brady. At the centre of this, we had a building, St. Joseph's. Now, the Social Services Centre was in that compound, but it would appear that everybody walked past, in inverted commas, the orphanage, the Industrial School, with a set of blinkers on. We don't want to know what's going on in there. Orphans have an excellent home in St. Joseph's Residential School, which also provides a nursery service for the children of mothers who are ill or who, for other reasons, are temporarily unable to care for them. They lack for nothing in the way of care and medical attention. Insofar as it can be achieved, the aim is to ensure that they live as full and normal a life as possible. It would appear that this great social revolution that's going on simply left these children behind because there certainly was no benefits of the social revolution in Kilkenny in the late 60s and 70s visited upon the detainees, and I call them detainees, of St. Joseph's Industrial School. In fact, they were left decades behind whilst the community moved in, in positive directions. And that's not to belittle the work that was done in the social services. But it is to say that there was, there's this huge, huge evil building where horrible things were perpetrated on children. So how much did the nuns know about the appalling abuse being suffered by the boys of St. Joseph's? The Sisters of Charity have declined to comment on this, saying that the matter is sub -udice. However, this program has established that in January 1977, one childcare worker wrote to Sister Conception, the nun in charge of St. Joseph's, saying that the situation at the school was, quote, highly undesirable and unsafe. In fact, he was so concerned that he resigned his job in protest. He still felt so uneasy that he in fact didn't just resign, he also went to see a person who he thought would be a natural ally. He went to see Sister Stanislas Kennedy and he put her in the picture and told her of what he felt was happening in St. Joseph's. And all we know that happened next was that, and again it emerged at the trial, was that one of the Sisters of Charity and a member of the Gardaí went to Dublin and just simply told Miles Brady not to come back to Kilkenny, and so he disappeared. This programme has obtained information that Sister Stanislas Kennedy was interviewed by Gardaí in 1995 during the course of their investigations into the sexual abuse of boys at St. Joseph's. Sister Stanislas confirmed to Gardaí that she had been told in 1977 that Miles Brady was physically abusing the boys. She said that, quote, I picked up on it that he might have been sexually abusing them as well, end quote. Later in her statement to the Gardaí, she said that, quote, with regard to what happened in St. Joseph's, you simply did not ask, end quote. This program asked Sister Stanislas to comment on what action she took on foot of this awareness of abuse. She declined to comment, saying that the matter was sub -udice. When I went to London, I was a rent boy, rent boy for three years, five years. I thought it was the right thing to do, to sell my body, to make money. 
they have a lot to answer for. The nuns have a lot to answer for. They were to look after me. They, did, they didn't do their job. They brought in men to spoil me, and spoil me in the wrong way, sexually, physically, and mentally. I can't forgive them for that. It's not good enough to say we didn't know in general terms, and in this specific case, well, people were being told. Uh, and so uh, I think that we need to, to nail that one as, as a, a lie. People did know about child sexual abuse. And whilst people may have not wanted to consider what it meant or the implications and perhaps the, 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 the framework for validating complaints of that wasn't there, they did know it existed. Someone knew. The nuns knew. The nuns knew. Someone, they had to have known. With that many boys being abused, I mean, we're not talking about two or three people, two or three young boys here. We're talking about 25, maybe more. It's the nuns knew. They had to have known. And other people in charge, they knew. And if they didn't know, they were pretending. Simply put, they should have been the first people that we looked after. They were the most vulnerable. They were the most needing of care. District Justice Kennedy in her report described the concept of overcompensation. They should have got more, not less, affection. They should have got more education, not less. They should have got more material comforts, not less. But what they got was they got 10 years of abuse. And that is something that I think we should all meditate upon. Because unless we learn from what happened in St. Joseph's and the other industrial schools, the same things will happen again. Maybe not in industrial school settings, but elsewhere. St. Joseph's. Hell. When I'm old and grey, that'll still be with me. I'll never forget. Even if I was to have brain surgery in the morning, I don't think you could ever forget.